Now, what we're told in the literature is that these two daughters that their son married were Hittites. And that was a judge to be problematic. Now, it's interesting that they're in Canaan at the time, but Hittites fare from Anatolia, from Turkey. They are Indo-Europeans. In fact, the, the first Indo-European language uh, in cuneiform and in hieroglyph comes from the Hittites. And you might recall, by the way, going to another part of the Older Testament, there was a woman named uh, Bathsheba who was married to a Hittite. And you know the story with David and all of that. Well, the Hittites uh, are uh, non-existent today. They fare from uh, central Anatolia, modern Turkey. And they're beginning to flourish as a very strong and dominant people uh, right about this time. If you uh, look back at the, the emergence of the civilization, never mind its decline. Uh, we're told here that uh, the parents of Esau were chagrined. We're told they had bitterness of spirit uh, on account of Esau, their son, marrying these women. We're not told the source of it. We could argue, well, they come from different cultures. Uh, uh, Isaac is from, or Isaac's uh, wife, anyway, Rebecca, you know, she's Jewish, and these people are from Turkey. But actually, uh, Rebecca herself neighbors Turkey from Padanaram, Syria. She, she's not born and bred in Jerusalem. Doesn't exist. She herself kind of sort of came from a family not far from that part of the world. But we're told here that the daughters-in-law fare from a different culture. We're told that. And we're told that, that uh, dad and mom are displeased. You with me on that? Now, I want you to look and see how it flowers in chapter 27. I want to go to the very end. We're looking at issues between Jacob and Esau. But I want you to look here in verse 46. Finally, Rebecca. Now, time has passed. And, and there's a story here about Jacob and Esau not getting along and tensions and all the rest. We're told in verse 46, subsequent to the story I'm not telling, then Rebekah said to Isaac, I am disgusted with my life because of the daughters of Heth. It's not just bitterness in spirit. And, you know, bitterness, if you look in Hebrews, it says, See to it that no root of bitterness spring up among you, for by it many become defiled. What happens is there's bitterness that lingers here, subsequent to which she's noted in the literature saying, I am disgusted with my life because of the daughters of Heth. And by Heth, Heth in Israel, or, or uh, Benot Heth, it's the same as Hittites. We were already told previously that they were Hittites descended from Heth. Rebecca says to Isaac, I am disgusted with Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth, like these women from the daughters of the land. What is life to me? Listen, if my other son does it, I'm going to kill myself. I can see her just kind of beating on Isaac's chest. This woman is not a happy camper. She says, my first son married poorly, and I can't stand it. I'm going to kill myself if my other son. Okay, this is just the beginning. And it's interesting, we're told subsequent to that, you know, women you know, have influence in, in the family system. In the wake of that, Isaac called Jacob and blessed him. Isaac an uh, uh, is an old man at this time. He blesses him and commands him and said, don't take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Now, by the way, uh, these women who Esau married were not from Canaan. They weren't Canaanite women, per se. We're told they were Hittites. And because there's no record of Esau ever going up there, people migrated. So you have Hittites 
Uh, you have uh, different people groups. We know that from the literature. There's all different kinds of ites that dwell in Canaan. And, uh, but the point is, is the mother here is vigilant. Uh, and she leans on her husband with the result is a command, don't take a wife from the daughters of Canaan, period. Get up. Go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take for yourself a wife from there from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. Uh, he won't have it. What he wants now is he wants Jacob. Uh, he, he doesn't want to leave it to chance. He doesn't want to roll the dice. Uh, he wants him uh, to go to his mother's ancestral home where he arguably, his family, you know, Abraham... Uh, they, they came from Ur of Chaldee, but they settled down in Syria and then eventually came down. But then they went back. There's family there. And uh, here you have the story of Isaac being beckoned to go back there. Uh, Isaac beckoning Jacob to go there uh, with the promise in verse 3 that El Shaddai, that is the Lord Almighty, will bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you so that you will become an assembly of peoples. And may he give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your seed, that you may take possession of the land of your sojourn, which God gave to Abraham. In verse 5, then Isaac sent Jacob away. And I would only add that he didn't just send him away, he sent him away empty-handed. Now, I'll return to that later, because if you look at the literature prior to this, we learn that, 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 that Isaac was very prosperous. The Lord had blessed him. He was extremely wealthy, all things considered. You might recall when Abraham sent Eliezer, uh, his servant, to Badanaram, Syria, to find a wife for Isaac. He was there with ten camels laden with all kinds of jewelry and gold and stuff to, to give in exchange for, for a woman. He, he, he was sent with all that wherewithal. Here it says, Isaac, bless Jacob and bless you. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and prosper you. But he gave him absolutely nothing. And uh, as you move on in the narrative here, and I'm going to return to that because I think that's interesting. That's always struck me as odd. It's always struck me as odd. He loves his son. He blesses the son. He wasn't inclined to favor Esau so much in the family system, but it gives him nothing. He's got to go alone. To me, it's just not the kind of thing that loving dads do. My opinion. My opinion. He can slap me upside the head in heaven for you know, criticizing him. In any case, now what happens, looking at the story, I'm, I'm interested in, in the family dysfunction. Esau observes... Esau's got wind of the fact that mom and dad just don't like my wives. You know, there's tension and there's a sense of that. And he sees that dad has sent Jakey up to uh, Padanaram, uh, you know, to find a woman more to their liking. So what Esau does, realizing that this thing is deteriorated, we're told in verse 8, then Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan were contemptible in his father Isaac's eyes. So Esau went to Ishmael and took Mahalat, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, Nebaoth's sister for his wife, besides his other wives. So uh, when, he, when he discovers, you know, mom and dad prefer that we, that we make these decisions within the family, what he does is he goes and marries within the family. He takes wife number three. He doesn't divorce the other two. So now he, he has three. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, if you look in chapter 29, verse 18, we know the story that Jacob goes away. Jacob was a mama's boy. Um, um, I think it's fair to say in the literature that uh, Isaac was more inclined to favor Esau, whereas uh, we're told that Isaac's wife, Rivka, or Rebekah, was more inclined to favor 
Jacob, who was always there in the kitchen helping out with the ladle and the kettle and what have you. Meanwhile, Isaac was the, you know, he was the uh, quarterback of the football team. He was the hunter. He was the type A alpha male. And uh, Jacob just didn't have, that, didn't have that disposition. He just stayed closer to mom. Now what happens, all of a sudden Jacob is pushed out and for the first time in his life, he doesn't have his mom as his protector, anyone or anything. He's alone in the world. And he just kind of drifts up into uh, Padanaram, Syria, a couple hundred miles. Keep in mind the average person never traveled 75 miles from their place of origin in the course of a lifetime, unless they were in the, on a military campaign. So he goes out there in, 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 in the crazy world, and serendipitously, he does happen upon, you know, God guides in the process, he happens upon uh, his mother's family, Laban, and he's there. Um, he comes empty-handed, but he's of the age of marriage, and Laban has daughters. We're told that Jacob then fell in love with one of them. We're told in 18, chapter 29, verse 18, that Jacob fell in love, or it says that he was in love, uh, with Rachel. So he said, let me serve you for seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. That, uh, so what he's going to do is work in the family business for seven years. He doesn't have any finances, anything to present, to impress. So he wants to accrue it over a number of years. Again, he's empty-handed. Uh, when Abraham sent uh, Eliezer up to the family, and subsequent to which then uh, 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 that uh, Rebecca came, but he was able to give all kinds of finery and goods and gold and silver and a, you know, a, a house in Malibu and a speedboat and you know, a Bentley. He was able to kind of give some goods and the family said, okay, if she's willing to go, let's trade. But he's got nothing. And arguably his father was richer than Abraham was <laughs> in a previous generation, nothing. So he works for years. To me, it strikes me as odd. I'm going to go back to that. So what happens is, is he marries her. They have a ceremony, and uh, uh, he wakes up the next morning. In verse 25, when it was morning, behold, there she was, Leah. Now, what happens is he wakes up the next morning, and he rolls over and says, good morning, Rachel, gives her a kiss and realizes it's not Rachel. Now, personally, I would have known that before I went to bed that night, on my wedding night, to tell you the truth. I think I would have probably figured that out. I think he had too much to drink, too much Manus he, 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 he was nipping on the berries, a little too much at the reception. And uh, so what happens is he, he wakes up the next morning, according to the literature, and discovers that he was hoodwinked, that he was hustled. Hey, Dad, what did you do to me? He says to him, to Laban, what is this you've done to me? Wasn't it for Rachel that I worked for you? So why have you deceived me? Subsequent to which, in verse 26, Laban says, you know, it's not, that, it's not that done that way in our place to give the younger before the firstborn. He, and there's a cryptic expression, complete another bridal week, or another, another seven, presumably seven years. Then, you know, you, you can have um, the other daughter for that. So sets up another contract, so now he's on the hook for 14 years of work, which lets you know how much money, again, he just didn't have. Well, after that, in verse 28, then, we're told that he completed it. Then he gave him his daughter, Rachel, to be his wife. Now, uh, so what I want you to see here, I said, this is the world's most dysfunctional family. I haven't even gotten into the dysfunction yet. All that I'm doing is priming the pump. All this stuff is easy. A little tension here, a little problem there, a little deceit here. This ain't nothing. Now it's going to get interesting. So what happens is Jacob is married to both of these women. Now, by the way, I should say I'm no fan of polygamy. I understand that it existed in the ancient world. I think when you have a number of married partners in the house, you're, you're looking for trouble, especially if they're sisters. Okay? I mean, if they're sisters, it's double trouble. I got news for you. Now, what happens here 
uh, in verse 31, the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, so he opened her womb. But Rachel was unable to conceive. So uh, it sets up in the narrative here. You know, Rachel was kind of unwanted. You know, uh, excuse me, uh, Leah was sort of unwanted, pawned off on Jacob. Jacob really wanted Rachel, but the Lord says, look, you know, it's, you know, here's what we're going to do. We're going to close up Rachel's room. Meanwhile, in verse 32, Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son and named him Reuben because she said, for the Lord has seen my affliction. Surely now my husband will love me. Then she became pregnant again and gave birth to a son and said, for the Lord heard that I am hated. So he's given me this one also and named him Simeon. Then she became pregnant again and gave birth to a son and said, Now this time my husband will join himself to me because I've given birth to three sons for him. For this reason he was named Levi. Then she became pregnant again and gave birth to a son and said, This time I praise Adonai. For this reason she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. Now I want you to see here, now there's relationships between the names and what's being described here. But just note uh, what's going on here? I'll have a baby for him. Now he'll love me. This is a woman who knows that she's not preferred, that she was pawned off on a man she didn't want, and what she's trying to do is uh, now maybe this will prompt him. Maybe this will prompt him. She's coming from an insecure place, and what happens is her sister ain't doing nothing, but she's producing all 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 that Jakey has to do is look at her, and she you know has a baby that that uh, you know she's real productive. Well, now he'll love me. Now, I mean, it's coming from, from a tender spot. It's coming from a weakness. It's coming from a hurt. And, uh, you know, people do that, you know. Oh, oh, okay. If you like, if you want me to lose weight, I'll lose weight. <laughs> you know, you want me to, bigger breasts, okay, I'll get implants. You know, you like blonder hair, brown hair, I'll dye it. You know, p people get neurotic to do these things to please the other. Of course, it never works. It, 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 it just doesn't work. Uh, when, when people put things on people like that, that's problematic. It just doesn't work. Well, here's this woman, well, well I'll go through this, or, or I'll do that, or all this, and then it'll be okay. Now, if you're looking, these boys are going to be the beginning of the 12 tribes of Israel, Reuben, Judah, Levi, you've probably heard those names. What I want you to see uh, I know you've heard those names before. What I wanted to focus on here is the mess, the wound, the tension, the problems that they came from. And I'm not done yet. If you look in verse chapter 30, when Rachel saw that she bore no children for Jacob, Rachel was jealous of her sister. So she said to Jacob, give me sons. If there are none, I'll die. She's there, you know, beating on his chest. You know, listen, I want to have kids. You know, she is vexed in spirit. Jacob became furious with Rachel. <laughs> you know, we're told in the literature. He says, I'm not God. You know, I can do what I do, but I can't, you know, I, I do my part in the process. But the fact that it ain't happening, it's, I don't have control of that. Frustrated as she is, jealous of her sister as she is, she concocts a scheme that um, was practiced in antiquity, but it's really not recommended. She says in verse 3, here's my maidservant Bilhah, go to her and let her give birth on my knees so that from her I may also build a family. You know, here's this servile woman of mine. What it is, is you take her as a wife, and, and, and she'll have a child, and then I will become the mother of the child. Now, that's kind of, I mean, that happened in antiquity, but, but that's a recipe for disaster. You know, even today when you have adoption and foster, you know, you want to keep a firewall between uh, the child's biological family of origin when they want to come back. It creates problems. And, uh, but here it's all within the same tribe. Then, in verse 4, she gave her maidservant Bilhah to him for a wife, and Jacob went to her, and Bilhah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. So Rachel said, God has judged my cause and heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore she named him Dan. 
Then Rachel's female servant became pregnant again and gave birth to a second son for Jacob. So Rachel said, I've surely wrestled greatly with my sister. Also, I've won. So she named him Naphtali. Now I want you to see here, we're six kids into it. And they're all coming with tension and intrigue. And, you know, it's all coming from, from messy space. That's why I say the, the world's most dysfunctional family. Oh, yeah, the Hebrew people, the 12 tribes of Israel, the blessing, the patriarchs. Okay, but look at where it all comes from. What a mess. I say this is dysfunction on steroids, and I'm not done yet. So what happens is Leah has four kids. Rachel says, here, take my maid, and she has a few. Now, in verse 9, Leah sees that she stopped having children. So she took Zilpha, her female servant, and gave her to Jacob as a wife. In other words, I'm not going to let my sister get one over on me. You know, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. I mean, meow. We have a little cat thing going here. This is just a train wreck. These women are hurt. Everybody's hurt. Everybody's coming from a messy place. Everything comes from a messy place. Then in verse 10, Zilpha, Leah's female servant, gave birth to a son for Jacob. And Leah said, how fortunate. So she named him Gad. Then Zilpha, Leah's female servant, gave birth to a second son for Jacob. Leah said, how happy am I, for daughters have called me happy. So she named her Asher. I don't think she's really happy. And uh, so when, when you look at this family, uh, it, it's just a train wreck. We're told then finally again, uh, Jacob goes and lays with, with his wife, uh, Leah. In verse 17, God heard Leah and she became pregnant and gave birth to a fifth son for Jacob. Leah said, God gave me my reward because I gave my female servant, to my husband. So she named him Ishakar. Then Leah became pregnant again and gave birth to a sixth son for Jacob. Leah said, God has presented me a good gift. This time my husband will honor me, for I've borne him six sons. You know, looking at her sister and say, take that. I'm better than you. I'm, I'm tired of being second fiddle. You know, when we used to go to the mall, all the boys did a double take at you, and I don't think anybody noticed me when I was standing next to you, and I've hated it all my life. So there. Afterward, she gave birth to a daughter, in verse 21, named Dina. So again, this woman's very fertile. There's a lot of pain in this family. There, there's a lot of trouble in this family. Now, if I was writing a book about a holy people and God's plan, I don't know that I'd include all this. Then God, we're told, finally in verse 22, remembered Rachel. Remember, she was the one who was loved. She was the one that Jacob really had the eyes for. But she's in this frustrated existence for years. A cat fight with a sister. It, 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 it was not a monster of her own making. It was imposed upon her because of a father, you know, who was stealthy and the like, who, who hustled Jacob. So, I mean, she's living in this world. Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. Now, she's, she's, she's calling out for years, as you might well imagine. It says, finally, God listened to her. I mean, I would imagine he could have done, he could have listened to her a whole lot sooner. According to the language of the text, finally. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. So she, she said, God has taken away my disgrace. And by the way, in antiquity, more so than in modernity, we live in a modern world, people realize there can be medical issues that prevent pregnancy in antiquity. If you didn't have a baby, there's something inherently wrong with you. Either your husband doesn't want you, or they're gods or punishing you. Take your pick. But the point is, uh, woman, women don't carry that well. 
and, and there's a certain disgrace about that. And by the way, it's interesting. Uh, if you look at the patriarchs, look at the wives. Remember, there's Abraham, who's married to Sarah. She couldn't bear a child for anything. Finally, in her old age, she bears. If you look at uh, her son uh, Isaac and his wife Rebecca, we didn't look into it. We know she became pregnant with, uh, with, with Jacob and Esau, but we're told in the literature that she couldn't conceive and that her husband uh, interceded for her and God heard his prayer and she became pregnant with the two boys that are then noted as wrestling in the womb. But the literature is explicit that she uh, could not bear. And now we're looking here at all this childbearing thing where God has to intercede. If you, you know, you can talk to a Jewish person today, I can't believe in that Jesus Christ stuff, that virgin birth stuff, I can't believe in that I'm Jewish. Well, I can understand it doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <laughs> I mean, that's just not a New Testament gig. You know, a Jewish person can say, I don't believe in Jesus Christ, I can't believe in that virgin birth stuff. Okay, now if the New Testament didn't say Jesus was, was born of a virgin, that he was just born naturally, someone could object, well, I can't believe in all that. When we look at what God's doing in the world, it all comes through miracle births. Uh, it's interesting here, God remembered and listened and opened. Then she became pregnant and said, God has taken away uh, my disgrace, and so she named him Joseph. Finally, if you go to chapter 35, uh, we'll look at uh, boy number uh, 12. Uh, they're on the road, and what happens is uh, this woman tragically will die in childbirth. Rachel will. Uh, much more common in antiquity than in modernity, though trouble can happen uh, in modernity, um, but much more precarious in the ancient world. We're on the road here in verse, uh, chapter 35, verse 16. They traveled from Bethel, and while they were still a distance from entering Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth, but her labor was difficult. While she was struggling to give birth, the midwife said to her, Don't be afraid, for this is also a son for you. Now, as her soul was departing, for she died, she, made, she, she, she named him Ben-Ami. But his father said to him, Benjamin, Ben-Yomen in Hebrew. Then Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem or Bethlehem. Jacob set up a memorial stone over her grave, and it is a memorial stone over Rachel's grave to this day. So from the writing of the literature, it's harking back uh, to the place. Now, what I want to note here in the literature is what I've said, uh, that if you look at the story here, uh, there's a considerable amount of dysfunction. It seems to me that everything is going wrong. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't write, I, I wouldn't make it happen like this. And if it did happen like this, or since it did happen like this, I don't know that I'd write about it, but I'm not God. Uh, the story uh, is here for us to look at and critically reflect on. Now, I don't know uh, what you think about your own imperfect world with family tensions and the like, how they might exist. Uh, but they do exist. Is there anything that we could learn from it here? Well, it seems to me, among other things, that, that just because there's difficulty doesn't mean God isn't working. Sometimes God works through interesting pressures in order to accomplish his purposes. I think it's fair to say that, uh, that, that, that sometimes, in ways that we wouldn't expect, uh, the, the Lord works through... Uh, these difficult circumstances. I think that's amply attested in the literature. Speaking of which, what I want to do is, is go back to a principal question, talk about difficult circumstances. Uh, it's something that I, I alighted upon earlier that I just want to land on and unpack a little, throw it open then for conversational purposes, and then we'll call it a night. I'm interested, as I'd said earlier, if you'll go back to chapter 28, Understanding that a lot of this difficulty was set in motion because 
Little old Jacob, or poor old Jacob, wound up in Syria with, without two nickels to rub together. If he would have had money, he could have just traded off with Rachel and come back home and call it a day. Um, but interestingly, uh, he was sent off with nothing. And uh, so one could argue that, that it's, his pro it's his father's or whatever. There's a mishap, there's negligence, there's something there that sets in motion things that later flower in a way that's not preferred. I just want you to look again in chapter 28, and I want to read verses uh, 1 through 5 again. Isaac called for Jacob, and he blessed him. And I have reason to think it's sincere, and commanded him, saying, Don't take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Get up, go to Padanaram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take for yourself a wife from there, from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. Now, if I was a father, and I married someone from the family, and I'm sending my son, I would send him with a lot of wherewithal and gifts and the like to bless the family. So the family up there in Padanaram knows how good I'm doing down here in Canaan. But it seems to me to send him up empty-handed like that, uh, it, it, to me, it, it raises certain questions. Now, he continues to bless. Now, to me, it's interesting that he's blessing, but he's not blessing. You know, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and here, go. And by the way, I have a lot of money, but I'm not giving you nothing. I mean, on the one hand, it sounds like we're blessing, but we're not blessing. It's like you sneeze and someone says, God bless you. It's that, don't take it too seriously. <laughs> don't take it too seriously. Really don't. Uh, but here, we should take it seriously. Now, may El Shaddai bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you so that you will become an assembly of peoples. May God bless you and make you something big, strong, and special, but I'm not helping. And may he give you the blessing, and I'm looking at verse 4, the blessing of Abraham to you and to your seed with you, that you may take possession of the land of your sojourn, which God gave to Abraham. May God give you good, may God bless you, can you so, so may God bless you so you can have good success without any help from me. <laughs> then Isaac sent Jacob away. And he went toward Padanaram, and I gave you an abbreviated telling of uh, the, the story here. I think, you know, I mentioned at the outset, you're going to see dysfunction on steroids. I think you know where I'm coming from. I mentioned on the outset that I'm particularly uh, troubled by what I had just reiterated here, this story of sending him away with nothing. But what I'd like to do as I close is kind of offer a telling of why. Why um, uh, send him away with nothing? Why does the Lord make it hard for people like that? Where people present to life where there are uncertainties, there, there's tensions, there's difficulties, there's things not going right at very deep personal family levels. Why do you know, bad things happen to good people? <laughs> you know, why this? Not only why does God do it, but why is it recorded in the literature? It's there in technicolor. It's vivid. It's, it's all there. You don't need to have a PhD in Old Testament in order to pull out from the literature what I told you this evening. To varying degrees, you're familiar with the story. I just decided to focus on this aspect of this portion of the Torah reading. And, the, you know, the question is, what do we learn from it? What can we do with it? Why? It seems to me that Jacob, who was a mama's boy, who was always taken care of by his mother, and in fact the journey of him going away to marry was precipitated by his mother saying, 
hey, Jakey, you better get out of here. Brother's saying he's going to kill you, and he probably will. I mean, even, even his, the alarm is raised to get him out of Dodge. This, this fellow who was always taken care of by his mom, who was rather weak-kneed in various ways, he needed to get out there in the world and learn that God can take care of him. Uh, it seems to me that there, there, you know, when you're at this station in life, you learn all about God on the road. There's a sense in which you're out there in the world and you're just kind of living it and doing it and seeing how the Lord shows up in your circumstance. That if you're going to be in the lineage of faith and destiny and God's purposes in the world, it seems to me that if you're in that world, you need to be able to get out there in the world and see the Lord show up in the world in ways where you have an understanding that that the destiny that I have, it's what he gave me. There were a lot of problems, but nevertheless, you know, let God be true, though everyone and everything be false. That, that there's that seeing that things have a way of manifesting in time, even if it takes a little while to get there. God, at the end of the day, shows himself faithful amidst the turbulence of trying times. I think it's important for people of faith in order to experience God on the road. You with me on that? Not in the church, not in the tent, just out there in the highways of life. I want to illustrate something that actually speaks directly to the road so you can understand um, why I mention it. And it's an application, it's an anecdotal story um, just from an experience today that uh, um, I know you don't come here to hear me talk about my life. You um, want to hear about the lives of these people, but if there's a way that something in your own story can embellish a point in this story, you know, it says, let the, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Paul didn't just preach the gospel. He said he preached my gospel. It's his gospel. It's, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. We don't just tell people Bible verses, but we testify. It says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You know, I mean, how has the, the Jesus story impacted with your own life? Well, here, I, a few months ago, uh, a contract evaluator, an agent with the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement, of his own initiative, had nothing to do with me, uh, who was interested in some of the research that I was doing at Cambridge University. He told me that he called up someone named Greg Smith and said, you know, Greg, you need to talk to this guy, Jeffrey Seif. Now, you might have never heard of the Center of International Law and American Law in Plano, Texas. Uh, it is um, a place where uh, judges go, where prosecutors go, uh, it, not just from Texas, and not just from America, but from all over the world. It is the center. It was uh, financed through the Senate. Um, and it is just uh, a center for international law. And it's where people come from all over the world. You with me on that? Now, so... I had contacted Greg Smith, who is the assistant director, um, and, and he wanted me to come up. He, he, he told me just over the phone, over a Zoom meeting a couple months ago, he says, you know, uh, I think I'd like you to be an ethics instructor. You know, we, we have a professor that's kind of retiring out uh, to, to be an ethics instructor. I says, well, okay, well, that's, you know. So... Um, I didn't know why. Well, I, I wasn't altogether sure why Malcolm Jackson, the, the agent from the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement Education, said, you need to meet Jeffrey Seif. Um, and I, I wasn't sure until I got there today. Well, that's when I had, he wanted to take me out to lunch. He wanted to show me around the facility. And by the way, the facility itself 
I, I, I was startled. I've just never seen anything that elite. Now, I've been in classroom at Harvard University, and I've been in a number of classrooms at Cambridge University. I'm not bragging, no brag, just fact. I've seen beautiful, you know, lecture halls, and I've seen nothing like this. Um, I, I, I'm, I have a very close association uh, with Collin County, their, um, their law enforcement academy there. The county just put in $41 million to build a training center, very nice, for police and fire. I've been there on a number of occasions. Um, I am friendly with Scott Donaldson, the director there, and I went there and said, oh my God, I've never seen anything like this. Well, when I went there this morning, uh, that place was a dump. Uh, I, I've just never seen anything like it. It, it just, of course, it, it's federal money that's poured into it, and, and people come there from all over the world. Now, I wondered why he would conceivably be interested in me. Well, I'm doing a thesis. I'm looking at the Holocaust. I'm looking at police and the co uh, European police and the Holocaust, among other things. It's part of my research. Um, when I went there, when he's given me a tour, it started to click that the center was put together by the influence of someone who was a, I forget, either a judge or a lawyer in, during the Nuremberg trials. And there's pictures all over the lobby. Now, the, the Jewish Holocaust museums wanted all that stuff, all that paraphernalia, but they, they tried to negotiate it and discuss it and it never happened. So they kept it there. It was founded in the wake of seeing injustice done against man and wanting people with power, you know, that have social power, juridical authorization, police, you know, district attorneys, judges, people who exercise that kind of power to have it moderated and, and in, embellished by the proper kind of values and virtues. Are you with me on this? So, I mean, I'm doing a dissertation on that. It all came together. He took me out to lunch, and I'm sitting in his car, and uh, there, you know how some people, you know, you have your rear view mirror, and people might hang something from it. He had a, a cross hanging from it with the two spikes, one going this way, no, that way. He's a strong Christian guy. And, uh, you know, we were talking about the Bible, and somehow... Uh, as I was on the road back, as I was driving back from that today, and uh, again, the, the genesis of it, it was, is, I'm not planning on jettisoning uh, things, but just an adjunct professorship to go there when there's different programs that might call for something, and, and I was honored to be considered for that. A name came up when we were talking, Herb Ashford, that name wouldn't mean anything to you. Been in law enforcement for many years here. He's assistant chief in the area. And he, he had mentioned Herb Ashford. And I said, Herb is a very, very, very good friend of mine. In fact, I married Herb. I was his pastor. And not only uh, was I his pastor, when my first di wife died, may she rest in peace, Herb was one of the groomsmen in our wedding party. We're that close. Now, speaking about on the road, so for me, I'm just kind of thinking that, you know, um, maybe the Lord's hand is in this somehow. There's, there's a few dots that are connecting. So I'm driving back from Plano, and, you know, traffic can really be a booger when you're, you know, you're, you're, you're leaving 35 on Dallas and going through Oak Cliff. It's just all tied up. So I'm sitting there in traffic. It's an absolute train wreck. You know, it's not only tied up because of construction. There's an accident up there, and it just—it's already bad, but now it's real bad. So I'm on the phone, and I call Herb up, and we're talking a little bit, and you know, I'm telling him, "Hey, tell me, how do you know Greg and this?" And so we're schmoozing a little bit, and um, so and I mentioned I'm stuck in traffic, and Herb tells me, says, "Yeah, he's stuck stuck in traffic too." I go, where's that? And then he looks, and he says, look to your right. <laughs> Sometimes there's 
you know, he didn't, he didn't put it together, so I rolled down my window, and oh, you know, it's, uh, sometimes the Lord puts together things that are divine appointments. It's stuff that you don't set up. It has to do with your own life, your own affairs, uh, that it prompts you to think that, you know, God's with you in something. And, you know, I think if you're a minister of the gospel, or if you're going to be a strong Christian, if you're going to testify, you have to have something to talk about. And it's good for life to be energized by examples of God's faithfulness in your own life and circumstance. And so when I think of, of Jacob on the road, why was he sent out into that uncertainty? Well, in a way, it's a drag, but he became very successful. You know, the Hittites aren't around today. Not a whole lot of Hittites, Amorites, Amalekites, Ammonites, Philistines. You know, you don't have a lot of that stuff today, but Jacob had his name changed to Israel, and Israel's still around. How about that? Thousands of years later, Amias Royal Chai, the people of Israel live, still around. You know, God has a way. And I think it's, it was important for Jacob to learn that God has a way. As I close this evening, I think it's important for you and me to remember that God has a way. Sometimes we just spend our, our, our minds, our time and our minds are just in our own abysmal circumstances. Sometimes it's family related, sometimes it's something else, you know, we just, uh, it's easy for us to have our lives kind of just mucked up in the gears of things going less than preferred. Uh, it's good to see God at work in the world, amen, and, and uh, you know, I want your test to be a testimony. That's the way I kind of sort of see this. Anybody else want to weigh in on any of this?